Hello, I'm Brent Moss, and you're watching The Defining Moment for Creating the Culture of Conscience. Joining me today are the National President and National Vice President of the Women's Federation for World Peace, which was founded in 1992 by Dr. Hak Jahan Moon, the wife of Reverend Dr. Sun Myung Moon. The Women's Federation for World Peace is active in over 120 countries and has general consultative status with the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations. Alexa Ward serves as the national president here in the United States and has been doing so since 1999. Mrs. Ward lives in Bridgeport, Connecticut and is a devoted wife and mother with four children. Alexa Ward, welcome to the Defining Moment. Thank you for being our guest today. Thank you, Brett, very much. It's a pleasure to have to you here. here. Thanks for coming. Sherry Reuter has served as vice president of the Women's Federation since 2001. She lives here in Los Angeles and is a devoted wife and mother of three children. Sherry also works as a school nurse. Sherry Reuter, welcome to the Defining Moment. Thank you, Brett. Thanks so much for inviting me. It's wonderful to have you. Thank you both for coming. It's really my honor to have you both here today. Our topic today is the vital role of women in achieving world peace. And I'd like to begin by asking each of you to share a defining moment from your own life, which really prepared you for this work of being a peacemaker. Alexa, I'd like to start with you. Could you share mm. a defining moment for us? Sure. Um, actually, I grew up in a very public family. My father was a member of Congress for 25 years. But it wasn't until I was 19 that I had my first, what I would call, public experience that really touched me and set me on a certain course. And the summer when I was 19, I joined the Quebec Labrador Mission Foundation and was flown up to a small fishing village on the upper St. Lawrence River called Mutton Bay in a little seaplane and dropped off in a little fishing village to teach the children how to swim. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew how to swim, so there were tragedies every year and drownings. Mm -hmm. Uh, everybody in this town lived in houses that were prefab, that had no electricity or running water, but had all the trappings mm. of, of sort of normalcy. But uh, it was a very, very simple town. Mm. And it was the first experience I had where I was there totally to do something for other people. Mm. And I found that I really loved it. And I found that that way of living was natural and comfortable and gave me back more than I gave. So even at 19, I could uh, feel from that experience that I wanted that component in my life always. Mm. So from then on, I really made sure that I was doing something on that level of other-oriented, focusing yeah. on the needs of other people, no matter what it was I chose. And you and found that, that really brings mm -hmm. you the greatest happiness in your life. I, it certainly brings me a depth of happiness that I want to keep close, yeah. yes. Well, that's beautiful. Really wonderful. Thank you so yeah, much for sharing you. that. I appreciate that a lot. Sherry, how about yourself? A defining moment which uh, opened you up for this mm -hmm. work of peacemaking that you do. I was uh, raised from the time I was a child in a, a Jewish family, and my father served in the Second World War. Mm. And the issues of that war um, and that time were very much a part of the house in which I grew up. Mm. So I remember that the Holocaust was very real to me and something that we talked about often. And I felt from the time that I was young that I really wanted to make the world a place in which something like that would never happen. Mm. So I kind of had that kind of a spirit about my life from the time when I, that I was very young. Mm. But you know, when you say defining moment, they, they happen at different times. And, and one that came to mind actually, so when my son, our first son is named Jesse, and when he was born, I have this memory, I guess it was maybe two or three days after his birth. Uh -huh. We had brought him home from the hospital and you know, we put him in his crib and we were sleeping in the room. And um, I think that night we must have been awoken maybe four or five times. Yeah. And uh, each time we'd get up and check him and we'd both get up and hold him and I'd feed him and then Dave would hold him on his chest. and. It was interesting because at the end of that even night, I remember I turned to my husband and I said, I don't think I ever loved anyone before. Mm. And I was thinking, you know, how many times, as much as we say we love people, and, and I always thought of myself as a very loving person, how much do we really sacrifice for others, for the dreams and the things that we believe in to give? And so it was really a defining moment, actually. So you felt a new depth of love. Yeah, there was possible. a different, yeah. 
it was like all of a sudden love was taken to a different level. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that was a defining moment. Wow, that's yeah. really, very interesting. It affected me, not just with my children, but really in my life. Yeah, that's, it transformed the way you go about loving people. Yeah, that's right. Well, it's very beautiful. Thank yeah. you so much for sharing that. I appreciate that a lot. Alexa, tell us about the Women's Federation for World Peace and the types of project which both of you are, are involved in. Okay. Uh, WWP USA has five program areas. Mm. Women of Faith, Benefits for Schools of Africa, Women's Middle East Peace Initiative, NGO Networking, and Interracial Sisterhood Project. Okay. So each one of these areas we have defined why we think it's important, and then we move it forward through programs. Okay. Programs provide people a way to meet us, to get to know us, to become more involved, and eventually actually take a leadership position. Great. Uh, we explain WFWP in terms of the founding spirit. The founding spirit is three points. Mm. The first is a commitment to strengthen the family. Okay because we believe the family is the cornerstone for peace in the world. Mm. Not an individual, not an institution, but the family. Okay. So the breakdown of the family is a very serious issue, a mm. serious impediment to peace. Mm. Number two, we refer to service for others in the spirit of living for the sake of others, as exemplified in WWP's service projects in 39 countries. Okay. And number th three, we refer to peace and reconciliation activities centering on our signature project, the Bridge of Peace Ceremony, mm. and our work with the United Nations. Okay, can you tell us more about those two, the Bridge of Peace and Bridge of the Peace. work with the United Nations? Yeah, the Bridge of Peace Ceremony is something very dear to all of us. Uh, 1995 and 96, we did a very unique series of programs in commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II. Mm. And over a two-year period, we created 20,000 pairs of sisters, Japanese and American. Wow. So during, before this pro project started, we were trying to think, how can we bring them together? What is the vehicle we can use to help them become pairs of sisters? Mm -hmm. And a couple of sisters had this vision for a bridge. Mm. <clears throat> so that's what we use. And actually, for those two years, we had made, custom-made bridges for each one of those cities. And the Bridge of Peace ceremony involves two women, or men, or children, or families, mm -hmm. beginning at the ends of the bridge, facing one another, coming, bowing, to acknowledge the wrongs done mm. toward, symbolically, toward one another, or the groups we represent. From, from World War II. Well, it, it, the bridge, in general, toward mm. anything, but in that particular program in World War II, and then coming closer and embracing. Mm. So first the sort of the repentance and then the embrace. Okay. And what we found, to our surprise, was that people had profound experiences mm. of leaving whatever their baggage was at the beginning of the bridge, so that when they actually embraced, they were meeting that person with a fresh heart mm. and a, a fresh mm. mind, like a sister. Mm. For some people, it was the first time they might have ever thought they could have that kind of even moment with someone so different from them. So from that two-year project, we've actually taken the bridge all over the world and used mm. it in every possible, what we call, enmity situation. Um, German and Jews, Korean and Japanese, blacks and whites. To promote reconciliation. To promote reconciliation. The bridge can't change anything. All it can do is give people a moment mm. where they see and feel differently. Just mm. a moment, like a window. If it's deep enough, it touches you in a way that you want to capture it and make that real over time. Wow. We did it in Israel in May 2004 with Arabs and Israelis, and that was a very deep experience. Mm. So we found it works anywhere. It has a magic in it, yeah. and uh, we've used it a great deal still to this day. Very Most of our programs yeah. contain a component of the Bridge of Peace ceremony. Wow. And then tell us about your work with the United Nations. United Nations is a very important part of our work. Um, we, WFWP is an NGO in general consultative status with the Economic and Social Council at the UN. We were given this designation in 1997 mm. upon the foundation of our international service projects. There are about five million NGOs in the world. Mm. The United five million? Correct. Mm -hmm. wow. And as you know, an NGO is usually founded by one person with a passion and concern about one problem. So they start 
a not-for-profit organization mm -hmm. to address it. Right. And then some stay tiny and some become huge. Yes. But that's the nature of an NGO. It begins with a passion or a concern. Mm -hmm. So the UN, since its charter, realized, founding in 1945, realized that the work of the United Nations could only be done hand in hand with civil society. Mm. Civil society is the part of society that represents the not-for-profit world. Uh -huh. So they made different levels within the UN that NGOs could affiliate. Mm. So when we applied in 1997, we were applying on the foundation of these service projects in 39 countries, yeah. which in and of itself is substantial. Sure. So we were awarded the top level. Mm. Uh, there are only 122 NGOs in that level in the world. Wow. And most of them are household names mm. with huge international foundations. Wow, that's really outstanding. We've been through two four-year terms, uh, three quadrennial reviews, and now we're in our third term. Wow, that's great. Gives us 22 representatives worldwide in mm. five different UN sites mm. and the um, opportunity to actually give input from our point of view to the General Assembly two or three times a year that they have to consider and print. So well, it's a very great. valuable part of our work. Well, that's really fascinating. Thank you yeah, so much for thank sharing. I appreciate that. Sherry, what's unique uh, for you about the work of the Women's Federation for World Peace? There are several things. Mm. One thing is it's kind of embodied when, when Alexa was talking about the sisterhood ceremony. Yes. In, in a sense, women have a very special place mm. as peacemakers. Mm. Um, and it really has a lot to do with the heart of women and who they are and what we can do as women if we work together. Women's Federation is a unique organization because it's so international and also because the relationships are not just a business kind of working together relationship, but everything we do is guided by a, very, a desire to have a very heart-to-heart -heart relationship with each other. So as an example, every year we have an international conference and our uh, representatives come from all the nations. Yeah. And uh, they're, they're just amazing conferences. I just, I have a memory of being in a hot tub in Korea with six African women from Sub-Saharan Africa and different nations and really sharing our heart. And I thought this, in some sense, is the stuff of peacemaking. I see. It is that making of relationship. Yeah. It's not just as the two women cross the bridge but it's what they do after they cross the bridge. Sure. It's becoming partners for peace. There's not enough of that in, in today's world. That's right. And I think Women's Federation really draws on the qualities that are best in women mm. and really encourages them to share them with each other, to make them part of their daily working reality. Wow. Tell us something else that's unique about your work. You know, well, it's just really, I know it's just so profound what, what it is that you're doing. Well, as you know, as Alexa mentioned, we have a, a vast network of humanitarian service projects mm. in 39 nations. Mm. The interesting thing to me is how those projects were started, because it says something about how we work. When we started those projects, volunteers would go to the nation, and they were asked, instead of starting a project, they were asked to really poll the women and children and to spend a good year living there wow. to find out what was needed by that community. An example that always comes to mind for me was, for instance, we have a school in Mozambique. Mm. And uh, the, uh, on the team of women that went there, there, were, there was one woman that I know who was a physician from New York. Mm. There was another Japanese woman who was a journalist. So of course, when they went there, they, they thought, well, we're gonna start a medical clinic. Mm -hmm. And certainly in the, in the town of Beira, which is the second largest city in Mo Mozambique, the ratio of physicians to population is one to 50,000. Oh, so Lord. certainly medical care was needed. Absolutely. But when they arrived, it's a country that suffered a long civil war and the entire educational infrastructure was broken. So a year after they arrived, after polling the women, they decided to build a high school and middle school. Mm. That high school and middle school now has graduated more than 2,000 students and has a 10-year track record and is just an amazing example of what a small group of women can do yeah. when they set their mind to doing it. It's kind of that spirit mm. of really working together as women, finding out what's needed and then providing it. Mm. That really is a part of the guiding spirit of Women's yeah. Federation yeah, for I love, Peace. I love the way you, you express that. That's beautiful. Thank yeah. you so much. It's great. Alexa, I'm sure almost all of our viewers have heard something about the founders of the Women's Federation for World Peace. Reverend Dr. Sun Myung Moon and Dr. Hak Jahan Moon. 
Please tell us about their unique vision for overcoming racial and religious struggles,、mm. which often lead to separation, division, and conflict in our world.、Mm -hmm. There's a lot to say.、Mm. It, my experience is that they have an extraordinary ability to bring people of vast difference together. People who ordinarily would not be in the same room together or the same hotel together. Yeah. And they come together because a vision is painted for them that's larger than their situation. So, people of conscience, people of goodwill, even though their situations are very different and their positions are vastly different, are somehow touched by the higher ideal, the higher vision for peace. They express a vision of heart that can be shared among people that's very unique.、Mm. And it's really based on. Sort of an unconditional kind of caring and and friendship and heart between people, and if you take that seriously, it's higher than viewpoints.、Mm -hmm. So it's usually viewpoints that get people in trouble, not、right. heart.、Mm -hmm. So if you can transcend your viewpoint and actually begin to look at someone more in a relationship of heart, you don't want to damage that. And I find that、uh, Reverend and Mrs. Moon have this ability. Through their own relationship, through the way they treat people, and through the vision that they can articulate, they really encourage and challenge people to go above the idea level and the position level, and to get into a realm of heart, which is really the only place you can begin to reconcile these things. They encourage、um, what I would call a familial view of relationships. So it's very hard to have an adversary if you really think that they're part of your family. Yeah. So the notion of world family, which is not a new notion, but the way they present it actually challenges people to behave like brothers and sisters,、mm. aunts and uncles,、mm. where younger are treating older with that kind of deference and respect.、Mm. When you get into that realm, your ideas and your opinions really become second, and you're forced to. Relate more on a level of heart. That may seem a very simplistic response, but any time someone's had even a brief time of that kind of experience with another person, they change. Yeah. And they begin to want to work things out.、Uh, so I would definitely say they bring a familial vision that challenges people to relate to one another on a whole different basis.、Mm. Then the opportunity to come together way beyond opinion and position,、mm. where they have to begin to work things through.、Yes. And now I would imagine that obviously God has something to do、oh, with、yes. what the, you know, <laughs> the fact they're able to do that so successfully. Yes. Can you say something about that? These are two people who are very confident that God has a will, and these are two people who spend their entire life. In a very serious effort to align themselves with that will,、mm. I think that anybody who does that is able to tap into a certain authority and mm. power mm. that allow them to help move the world. And when I say anybody, there have been other people in other parts of the world, other ages. We、yeah. could sit here and name quite a few、sure. <clears throat> who have also had that incredible commitment to stay close, to come as close as they could. To their understanding of God's will, and then really live it. To really be a channel for God.、Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think they're unique because the extent to which they live their words is very unique, and it gives them a certain moral authority.、Mm -hmm. It's not just words; they're practicing it day to day on an extraordinary level. Most people don't see that part, but it's true. Yeah. Thank you very much for expressing that. I appreciate that a lot. Sherry, please explain to us, in your view. Why solving the problem of family breakdown is essential to achieving lasting world peace? I think it's I think it's critical, and in in many ways, sometimes people have asked me, "Well, what is a partnership for peace?" I said, "Perhaps the most fundamental partnership for peace is the partnership between a husband and wife."、Mm. In some sense, it really begins with the individual. It begins with becoming a person of peace,、mm. a person actually who's capable of lo loving an enemy. Mm. A person who's capable of loving under adverse conditions and circumstances, a person who's capable of loving when it's not easy.、Mm. In some sense, in my opinion, we need to grow our own character to a certain point 
before we can really turn our love on another and make an eternal commitment. Mm. That commitment is so important then to the children. You know, it's interesting because I work as a school nurse and yeah. so I every single day have little ones in my health office mm -hmm. and um, really the breakdown of the family is crippling our children. Mm. That, that's where it really shows in it, it's most painful and actually probably the clearest way is in the breakdown of the family and its effect on our children. Uh, we're not raising a generation of hope. Mm. We're not raising a generation of happiness and light and possibility. But there's just a huge generation of children out there, a huge percentage of our children, they don't believe that true love is possible. Mm. They don't believe that you can live for the sake of another. And I think that the, really the fundamental stability of the family, the family is the place where children learn how to love. It's a place where children learn about who God is and through loving parents learn that God loves them unconditionally. That unconditional heart of the parent is what allows us to open our heart and mind to the bigness of God's love for us and for each person. So it seems that really what is peace in its essence, peace is not just the absence of conflict. Mm. It really is the presence of love. Mm. You know, it's interesting. We have lots of programs in our school districts these days about tolerance. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten to where I can't tolerate the word tolerance. <laughs> okay. I'm thinking, why are we teaching our children that tolerating each other is enough? Mm. It's really not enough to tolerate other people. That it's doesn't create peace. You need to love each other. Mm. You need to actually learn to care about another person who's different than you. Yeah. To really care mm -hmm. in a family way, in a familial way. Mm -hmm. And it really ties into the point that Alexa made about the family and that familial essence. So I really believe that without restoring in some sense the heart in the family, the presence of the family, the reality of good solid families, it's hard to think about building a world of peace. That's great. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Alexa, what do women bring to peacemaking that makes the work of the Women's Federation for World Peace so unique? I think Sherry touched upon it <clears throat> in terms of the unique qualities of a woman's nature. Mm. Uh, unconditional love, empathy, forgiveness, qualities which actually a woman has to exercise a lot to raise a family, to care for a family, to raise children. But these qualities are now needed on every level of decision making, and especially those levels of decision making that have anything to do with how nations are going to treat each other. Mm. If you have uh, elected bodies with 50% or more women, you're not going to have the choice for war is not going to be on the table. Mm. Women know that war means sending people's children into battle to die. Yes. That's what they immediately connect to in right, heart. Right. Mm. So they're not going to send their own or somebody else's. Mm. It's just not an option. Mm. I think women come with a connectedness of heart that needs to be expressed much more. I think women have felt very sort of shy about it, that it has its place, rather than understanding that it's, that level of heart is needed on all levels of decision making and, and uh, in a nation and in the world. So I think that's the, the main thing women bring. It's, it's a quality and depth of heart yeah. that allows them to see things a certain way, feel a certain way, that can really improve the quality of life for many people. Yeah. And maybe to expand on that a bit more, I would add to the qualities I mentioned, the ability to sacrifice. Uh -huh. It's not held up as a virtue these days. Right. You're supposed to avoid sacrifice You're at all costs. You're supposed to avoid sacrifice, yeah. and yet yeah. sacrifice is the very yeah. stuff that moves people. Yeah. And it's the very stuff that protects people. If yes. you think of the, the, the heart of sacrifice that both a father and a mother mm -hmm. have to exhibit in order to raise a family, yeah. sacrifice in time, sacrifice in money, many, many, many levels. Sure. Well, if the family, if the familial model is just the microcosm of all the other levels in society, it's the same thing. Mm. But we've really lost this sense of sacrifice as 
healthy and normal, let alone noble. Right. But I think women bring it back in because it's part of your life. If you're going to be a mother, there are going to be a lot of sacrifices. All those hours staying up yeah. to take care of the, the sure. newborn. Sure. It's on many, many, many levels. Yeah. But it becomes a part of your modus operandi. I mean, it's the way you live your life. Mm. But it needs to come, it needs to be a part of other aspects of life too. I think women can bring that back. Yeah. Okay, great. What have each of you found to be the greatest challenges in your work as peacemakers? I think in, in order to be a genuine peacemaker, like Mother Teresa, word and deed have to completely be in sync. Mm. What you say and what you do. Mm. That's right. Who you are and what you're doing mm. has to be completely one. Mm. And I think, especially in the kind of society we live in, that's a huge challenge. Yeah. To be that genuine, to be that honest about that part of yourself, sure. so that even the people who have to live with you in the, the most day-to-day -day moments can actually stand up and say, mm. yeah, my mom is really a person of peace. Mm. This is what she's taught me. So I have felt for a long time that the biggest challenge and the biggest homework is within ourselves. Yeah. Becoming a more public person, becoming a person more able to sacrifice, becoming a person who can spend more time on others than on yourself, mm -hmm. becoming a person who can express that kind of empathy and unconditional heart all the time, even when you don't want to. Mm -hmm. That's the realm we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I often see it similar to becoming a good athlete or a good musician. It's something you have to practice until it becomes effortless. And it takes a lot of practice. Well, wow, that's beautifully said. Thank you practice. so much for your authenticity and expressing it that way, Alexa. I appreciate that a lot. In, in your view, what is it that humanity as a whole has failed to comprehend about our God-given purpose in life and the meaning of life on this earth? What has humanity failed to comprehend? Fundamentally, it's that we're one human family. Mm. Mm. Because if you really understand that, I mean, I could say that God is our parent, but I think there's so many different versions of that and so many different ways of understanding that. But to understand that we really are one human family yes. with a heavenly parent, yes. <clears throat> you would have to change. Everyone would have to change so mm. much in terms of the way they feel, think, and act. Yes. That, that would and revolutionize the world. That, that one alone, concept alone. That alone. Yeah. That's because right. people can only do what they're doing that hurts one another because they allow the distance between one another. And in a familial setting, you can't do that. Well, we're out of time. I want to thank both of you so much for being our guests here today on The Defining Moment. It's really been an honor for me to have you both here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brett. Thank you, Brett. This has been wonderful. Thank you Thanks so much. I've really enjoyed it. You've been watching The Defining Moment for creating the culture of conscience. You can find us on the internet at www.definingmoment.tv. Thanks for watching and have a great day.